Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everybody. I am Florence Guedas from the Inter International Agency Nantes Saint Nazaire. I am very happy to welcome Gérard Berry here in Nantes. Gérard Berry is a French computer scientist, member of the French Academy of Sciences and of the French Academy of Technologies. He was researcher at the Ecole des Mines and INRIA. During 10 years, he worked also, also as a chief scientist officer of the STL Technologies Company. He is currently holding the chair Algorithms, Machines and Languages at the Collège de France. Now, some words about his research. Over 30 years, he has brought important contributions to at least three main fields. Lambda calculus and functional programming, parallel and real-time programming languages, and design automation for synchronous digital circuits. Gérard Berry is best known as the conceptor of the STRL programming language. Today, he will tell us why and how Algorithmic thinking changes our way of reflecting and acting in many fields like science and art. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gérard Berry. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to talk today about uh, mental inversions. Uh, I changed a little bit my title, as you can see here. Um, because uh, many people use mental shifts, but shift is not a precise word. You don't know how much you shift, while inversion is 180 degrees, as uh, the Babylonian would say. And I would like to show that it's not shift, it's really a revolution in the sense of the, the Latin word, which means turn around. It's turning around uh, many things in minds. And it establishes, of course, a lot of difference between new generation and old generations, which are not that easy to handle. Um, yeah, I forgot to do that, sorry. Up. So, the, we, we can see in France in the last two years a change of wording. The first one is informatic has been changed to numeric. That is computer science to digital or more or less like that. And last year, programming has become coding. And I wonder why these changes occurred. Uh, but maybe there is a reason, is that the mindset of people has changed a little bit. And maybe it might be a, a way for many people who miss the digital revolution several times, these people are very numerous in France, uh, to forget about the past and, and uh, pretend building a new competency. So why not? I say, why not? Uh, we have to accept that, after all. Uh, when people change, it's welcome. Good. But the new warning should not mask uh, very important things. The first thing is that the heart of the digital world remains computer science and computing technology. It, it is a technical and scientific world. It's, it is not just thinking about what's happening because of computing. Uh, and programming, which is now called coding, is only one aspect of it. And everybody rushes to coding, but uh, you need much more than coding. You need coding, but you need much more than coding. You can code very stupidly. That's fairly well known, unfortunately, and done. And uh, the main thing is that the world is now organized by people who really know about computing, what it means, about algorithmic thinking. And uh, they don't just play with buzzwords, which is uh, something you find quite often. And I think, and we think with my community, that ignoring what algorithmic thinking really is keeps many people as spectators or commenters. And that's probably not, uh, and not actors, that's probably not what we want in a modern country. Uh, being spectator of what is done in the US and uh, Korea and Japan is not exactly what will lead us to prosperity. Good. And uh, the talk will be about the fact that uh, computing generates true mental inversions and not just shifts, and I will show that through many examples. So the agenda is simple. First, I will explain a little bit about computing. Uh, 
many people know it, but sometimes it, it can be useful to see how to explain that to other people as well. Uh, mental inversion, what they are, and then uh, what they are in science and engineering, then we'll talk about bugs. And lagging education, which I see a, a major problem worldwide, but, uh, but the French is uh, really, really uh, on the top list of the bad places right now. And conclusion. So the pillar of computing, what are they? Uh, we say, we are used to say that there are four pillars in computing. Uh, information, algorithm, languages, and machines. Information is processed conceptually by algorithm, which are implemented in programs written in languages and run by machines. And through interfaces, we feed the system and uh, machine feedback to us. That's okay, but uh, this picture is far too simplistic. First, most of the machines are in objects, not connected to human beings. I think it's, uh, right now it's about 98% of the microprocessors are in objects, okay? And that will become much worse or worse, depending, uh, uh, I mean, it will grow. And in fact, it's both, it's both, it's all objects, so it's us and the objects. So that's one thing. The second thing is that computing takes a lot of care of itself, so that uh, the, this is a complete tetrahedron because uh, uh, machines are so big they can only be built by algorithms and programs, and uh, uh, the information about machine is huge. I mean, a circuit uh, is in, uh, in uh, many terabytes, the description of a circuit is many terabytes, so it's a huge object. And uh, the main thing compared to natural sciences is that computer science is a building science. It's not studying nature, it's building a new nature. You'll see that it is also studying nature now, but its main goal is to build something that doesn't exist in nature, and so it's very different. And uh, usual scientists have a lot of problem understanding that. They think that science is about computing nature, except mathematics, which is weird, but computer science is different. Good. So here is a portrait of the Algovarismi, the inventor of algorithm. Many people st st still think it is a Greek word. No, no. Algovarismi, who also invented algebra in his book Algebra, uh, which is how to solve equations, basically, a uh, revolution in mathematics. And uh, this is uh, his uh, grave, the sculpture on his grave in Uzbekistan. Okay, now I would change a little bit the mindset by saying that there are, to me there are six pillars on computing, and not four, so it's a little less pleasing. But interfaces are very important and very often neglected by classical computer scientists. Classical computer scientists had a lot of trouble adapting to the web, for example, um, or, or to uh, telephones. Um, and uh, the, the next one is bugs because bugs are really intrinsic to computing, and if you don't know what uh, bugs are, and if you don't know how to try to handle them, then uh, you should not do much computing. And uh, unfortunately, many commercial systems, including one I have to use for transportation, for example, are just full of bugs and never reply to bug reports. Uh, French people know the example I mean. Uh, well, it's a great science with uh, thousands of algorithms, a lot of people working on it. And you can say that there are two kinds of algorithms, generic, which don't care about the data, like transporting data on the internet, it's uh, data insensitive, or specific, and uh, you see the specific growing, uh, but uh, the generic as well. For example, learning algorithms are fairly generic and they grow uh, very interestingly now. Good. And the common concerns for algorithm are, the first one is correctness. Huh? Uh, many people talk about efficiency, but if the algorithm is not correct, it's not very interesting to be efficient. And efficiency in time, space, and energy now, which is the number one thing in the circuits and everywhere. Good. So let's look at mental inversion provoked by algorithms. And you see that through, through discussing with kids. So I've, I've been working a lot uh, teaching kids and uh, discussing with kids and gathering history from friends about kids. And the mental, in the, the first one, I love it, is from a friend at Sofia Antipolis. His son came back home and uh, said this, this wonderful sentence, daddy or neighbor has an incredible computer. You type and there it prints. So she, the, uh, this boy just saw his first typewriter, okay? So he never, he never thought that a thing like that could exist, and he was very, very surprised. So it's interesting, you see? So that, that, uh, that's a shift. The last uh, typewriter was produced three months ago, I think, uh, somewhere in, uh, in the world. 
Good. Let's, let's see some inversions in other fields. Uh, photography. I'm a photographer, so I'm a, a great user, user uh, of uh, photography technology. And clinical photography had a very simple meaning. You click on the camera and the photo is taken. In uh, digital photography, it's completely different. You click and then you start a lot of algorithms that will completely change the photograph because you don't want the photograph to be real. You want the photograph to give you the impression you want on your brain, which is highly different. And for example, on this cathedral, the lines are curved. This is a property of optics, but it's a predictable property of optics, so you can unwind it. And by smart algorithm, difficult algorithm, uh, you can, and also the light is difficult for photography, and uh, you can transform that this way, totally automatically, and all the cameras do that now. All the decent cameras, even the cheap ones, uh, start doing that now. And it's a major revolution. And all medical imaging is based on the same, uh, same principle. All modern sound processing, which is quite different, is based on the same principle. So when you take a photograph be it, uh, with your fancy camera or with your telephone, uh, you start a bunch of complex algorithms. And what has made progress in photography is mostly algorithms. Sensors as well, but algorithms are more important. Digital maps. So this is an interesting story. You know that. A digital map, a, a digital photograph taken from an airplane, but uh, there, no airplane ever went to this place. Okay? So that's mathematically computed and uh, uh, from various sources, choosing various sources, very interesting. I had to, to interact with the French education system uh, in uh, 2006, it's not middle age, 2006, and they called me to say what the digital thing could do in education and say, uh, well, I would like to show you an example, maps. Uh, when you are 12 years old, there is in the program of math uh, uh, dealing with maps. So what is it? So in 1999, which is middle age for in this talk, uh, what you have to do is buy the map. You have to go to a shop to buy the map and to find the scale because there are maps at all scales. Unfold the map, which is not an easy operation everywhere. Uh, search for the current position and search for destination of itinerary. This is what they teach kids. Uh, I told them, you know, uh, it's a little bit different now because uh, now you, have, you, you turn the map on, you have it. There is no way not to have the map. Uh, it includes all scales. Then the first thing you know is where you are. And then you have to search for the rest, but by typing names. So explaining how you use a, a, a map, uh, a 20th century map to a kid is very interesting, but maybe it belongs to history courses. Uh, and, and that's not bad. I mean, it's very interesting to build a museum of 1999. It's very hard even for ourselves to know how we could work with a no cell phone and no Google. It's, it's difficult to imagine. Okay. It doesn't impress the kids that much because, for example, a kid told his uh, parents, uh, Google Street View is not interesting. I don't see myself in my house. What is bullshit? Communication. It's a more interesting inversion. It's the, the oldest one, I think. So in our communication, it's well known. You had one wire per communication, a, a, a completely continuous a copper wire from New York to Delhi. So you can imagine the result or remember the result. So it went digital, where, where you can uh, compress voice, put it into packets, have error correcting codes, uh, share lines, it's very interesting, but it didn't change anything for the user, except the bill was, was uh, no, the bill was even the same. But when it goes wireless, ah, that's a big change. Big change that was not realized in France, where uh, wireless phones were hated in the beginning. Uh, space constraints disappear. So here is the mental inversion by two very simple sentences. When I was organizing an evening at home, I would call a friend and she will not be home. This is the normal rule. So uh, ring, 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 and that's all. Now when I call somebody, the first question is, where are you? So this is universal. You go in the streets and they, 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 what you hear the most is, where are you, where are you, where are you? OK, complete change. It's not a shift, it's an uh, inversion. Uh, I love this one, a four years old uh, 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 boy coming to his grandfather, a friend from the academy, and say, uh, so, so a phone with a wire going to the wall and say, why did you put an antisept cable? So it's a very different perception, it's, uh, it's fun. It's not fun for kids, I mean, uh, the past is fun for kids. Of course, this is the biggest one. 
euh, une tarte à la crème en français, uh, I don't know how to translate that in French. Uh, I heard very much when I tried to push informatics in the teaching in France, I heard very much they think computer is not very important because from a computer one can only get one one did put in. Which is sort of true but still useful when you do four plus three equals seven you get less than you have put in because seven is less information than four plus three because five plus two is also seven, but it's, it is useful. So, but I could never convince people with this argument. So this is, this is the view of uh, Homo bureaucratus, the 20th century. And now, of course, the big change is there. From internet, I get what the rest of the world has put in. And so that, that, that this is a big change and people have realized that now. And it's, uh, it's very important, but the consequences are far from being understood now. But you know that, and there are many talks about that, so I won't add anything. This one is fantastic. It's a true story. Mom, you told me that when you were my age, you had no computer. Then how did you connect to the internet? Ten years old, uh, two years ago. Okay, this girl could not imagine a world where internet did not exist, simply. Uh, internet, and I will say that again later, it's just like a cat, a mountain, or the sea, a part of nature for kids. It's a part of nature. It's not an artifact. They take a lot of time. Uh, they know a little bit. They know a little bit it's an artifact. For, for example, my granddaughter, you will see in a moment, when she was two, she would try to remote control absolutely everything, but not cats. So they know a little bit. Uh, there is a fabulous book, really, really fabulous book you have to read. It's called The Victorian Internet by Tom Standage in 1998, which tells you the story of the telegraph, which is probably on the same scale as the internet, but even faster. It's amazing. It's, it's completely, and you have the same thing. People saying, because of the telegraph, uh, democracy uh, will prevail, there will be no war. I mean, I mean the same bullshit that we heard for internet. And uh, it's very interesting, the comparison. Okay, science. Uh, algorithmic approach to natural sciences. Natural sciences, some of them have, are using mathematics, some not. For example, physics, astronomy, earth sciences use mathematical modeling. Biology doesn't, or very little. Use statistics, but not modeling. But now, natural sciences will be fed by algorithm, uh, algorithm, which is a very big problem for scientists, by the way. And of course, algorithmic instrument and simulation, and astronomy, it's obvious, everywhere. Algorithmic instruments, that is, uh, instruments based on physical sensor coupled with algorithms uh, are everywhere. And also modeling of the living. Modeling of the living is a big, big, big thing. Many scientists are surprised by the quality of their simulation. I saw a talk last Saturday by a great scientist who, who had uh, uh, really simulated uh, sand dunes, sand dunes in the desert. It's not an easy thing. And they found a very nice solution using cellular automata, probabilistic cellular automata. And according to some wind patterns, you obtain exactly the dunes you have in nature. So they say, all simulations are, are very nice. But in fact, I told him it is much more than that. You are just unveiling algorithmic laws of nature. Laws of nature, people used to think they are equations. Yeah, not only, there are many more algorithms and equations in nature, especially in the living. You are full of algorithms in here and in your legs and uh, everywhere. So that's, that's extre extremely important. One of the messages I want to give today, laws of nature will be expressed by algorithms. And that's a huge mental inversion to come in sciences. Some people accept it, most people don't because they don't know what is an algorithm. I had many proofs recently and that's normal. I mean, they had uh, their own work to do. Let's start with astronomy. So I like this example because this is the simulation of an explosion of a supernova. And that's very fundamental because in this part here where there are vortices, uh, this is where you are built. This is where all the heavy molecules are built. So that's something very important. But why do the, astron the astronomers make simulation? Because they never got the budget to do that in the lab, to have a supernova expl explode in their lab. It's actually a little difficult, so we are happy they don't get the budget for that. They get a lot of budget. Uh, and so they have to resort to simulation. And now they simulate incredible things in astronomy. If you see the recent works, 
And one of my friends who is a great astrophysicist in France, she told me that now they are, they are getting back uh, people from physics, uh, particle physics, because there are just a huge amount of uh, uh, people in particle physics, and they want to, because uh, astronomy has to do with particle physics, they want to do astronomy, and they say we can do nothing with them because they don't know anything about the algorithmics and programming. And uh, now our main job is algorithmics and programming. Ah. And she's a physicist. Huh? Algorithmic medicine, that you know probably. Uh, if you see the operation room in Strasbourg or in many other places, it's a huge room with dozens of huge screens. And this is, this is operational, <laughs> doubly operational for operations. Uh, the, the, the surgeon is operating with virtual reality images projected on the body. Uh, because this has lots of advantages, for example, having no blood in the, in the operation field is quite interesting. And uh, for the people who like that, there is a fabulous course at Collège de France this year, which is all the, you can download on video, uh, with uh, seminars by uh, great doctors, from digital imaging to the digital patient. That is, you will be modeled by algorithms. Not everything in you, not the brain, but uh, the organ, the, the heart, certainly, it's already uh, on the way and uh, many other things, and uh, that's very, very important, but that's well known. Neurosciences are also uh, very much changed by uh, algorithms. Um, there are a lot of things. I work with uh, neuroscience people on uh, oscillation in the brain. Uh, what is the neural code? That's a big mystery. It's probably a very versatile code, which is extraordinarily good, uh, energetically speaking, very, very smart and that can do a lot of different things. But uh, I won't talk about that. But uh, on uh, neuropsychology, so Stanislas Dehan is a fabulous guy at Collège de France, and he wrote this uh, book uh, called uh, Le, The Neurones de la Lecture, The Neurons of Reading, which is explaining how you learn to read and what's happening in your brain when you read. This is fabulous. And uh, he's working on, uh, on babies and making uh, nice discoveries on babies, that is, uh, babies have uh, very, very fancy algorithms built in their brain. That means you too, huh? but uh, very early. Long ago, we were uh, thinking that babies are not very clever until three, five. And uh, well, they work with babies right now of uh, 10 years, uh, 10 months old, because it's easy to work with them because they, they, they fix things. When they, when they like it, they <coughs> or when they are, uh, when they are stunned, they, they fix with the eyes, so it's very easy to track with cameras. And so they discover a very interesting fact, I mean, not them only, there are big groups in the US, and it's a collective work. Uh, let me see, uh, uh, try to explain what it is. Okay, so you take a 10 month baby, which uh, doesn't know how to talk, understand whatever you say, huh? no question about that, doesn't know how to talk clearly, and you put in front of it a screen with uh, this kind of thing, but uh, you do that uh, in a more attractive way, not just uh, blue dots, but uh, little toys or whatever. And there are, there are a lot of blue and one red, and they start turning like uh, lotto balls. You see bingo balls that start, that start turning, and there is this channel here. And after a while, you, you, you put a cash in front, and one of the balls falls. Then it's very interesting what's happening. If the blue ball falls, the baby doesn't care. If the red ball falls, the baby says, <laughs> okay. And the more blue balls you, you, you put, the more the gloop is, uh, is strong, okay? And uh, so that means that the baby is doing statistics. And he didn't learn anything very clear. Uh, parents don't, uh, learn, don't know statistics, so they cannot teach that to their, to their baby. And, uh, and you have a much more elaborate phenomena. For example, if instead of, uh, uh, of uh, having the blue falling with the probability corresponding to the number of balls, uh, you let the, the red fall quite often. So in the beginning, the babies are very surprised, and then when a the blue comes, they are surprised. So they have adaptive statistics, not only ad temporal adaptive statistics. And that you can really uh, model with a Bayesian model, which is a classical probabilistic model from a few centuries long, but Bayesian algorithms are very nice, and we have absolutely no idea of what's going on in the brain of the babies. Well, what we know is that they have implemented Bayesian algorithm in their brain. There are more, uh, even more interesting cases, like this one. That's more surprising. Because here you have a, a cell, isolated cell with all the blue, 
and uh, a cell with the red on the bottom. So if the red falls, the baby don't care. If the blue falls, they are really surprised. So that's much more interesting because it means that in addition to the statistics, they know a lot about geometry and topology. That is that the, the, the blue ball should not cross the boundary. So explaining that is not done absolutely clearly. They work for very long. So if you are interested in that, uh, there are many more things in the, in the course. And uh, it changes completely the view of education. Of course, babies are much more clever than what we thought. And uh, we knew they were clever, but uh, we didn't know there were statisticians and they were uh, geometers. And uh, so we have to rethink a lot of things. Mathematics. Mathematics, uh, what is the relation between algorithmic and mathematics? My friend Gilles Dweck wrote a book called Les Métamorphoses du Calcul, The Metamorphosis of cal cal uh, Computation. This book got the great, uh, the great prize of the Académie Française, which is not that frequent for a, for a computer scientist. And he explained something well, actually well known, he does it very well, is that mathematics is the child of algorithmics and not the converse. That is, when, uh, when the Greeks le, uh, invented mathematics long ago, like Pythagore, uh, Pythagorean or Euclid and so on, uh, they were using, they were reasoning about algorithms that were known much before. For example, A2 plus B2 equals C2 for uh, a square triangle. Uh, this was used much before. So the idea of mathematics was an extremely deep idea, which was to prove that this known thing was true. But the thing was known. So algorithms are very, very, uh, very old, and it's interesting to that uh, uh, in France, especially, we think that we have uh, French and England have the same uh, background. They think they have invented everything, but um, if you if you remember negative numbers, uh, negative numbers were introduced in France very late and uh, hated by many mathematicians. While if you read books of the 600 uh, by uh, Brahmagupta in uh, India. Uh, who are summarizing much older uh, knowledge. Yeah, there are wonderful sentences like uh, a gain plus a gain is a gain, a debt plus a debt is a debt, uh, a gain multiplied by a debt is a debt, a debt divide, uh, multi divided by the debt is a gain, except if the debt below uh, is zero. So they knew a lot of things and have a very nice uh, uh, sentence of a French merchant, a rich guy who uh, went go to the Sorbonne, that was in uh, 1700, and asked a professor, um, uh, my, my, uh, my son is good for sciences, which didn't mean the same at the time, it means knowledge more, uh, where should it go to learn about numbers and the rest? And the, uh, in Sorbonne, the professor replied, um, well, he wants to, uh, to learn about addition and subtraction. He could do that in any good uh, French or German uh, university, but if he wants to, uh, to learn about multiplication and maybe approach division, he should absolutely go to Italy. Ah, interesting for the cultural level we had. Uh, why? Because in Italy there was Leonardo da Pisa called Fibonacci who had imported the work of uh, Alcovarismi, and what, which was not very well known in France yet. So mathematics. Mathematics is the pure science. It's a, the science of uh, wisdom, of knowledge, of proof, proof, proof. Is that true? It's not clear. So let's see, for example, the, the, the sorry, I made a mistake. You, you know the four-color theorem. Uh, the four-color theorem is you, you take a map and you ask uh, how many colors you need to, uh, you need to, well, it should be in front. Okay, I, I will put George on the back and that's all. Fine. So, how many colors do you need to color the map in such a way that two adjacent countries that share a boundary, not a point, uh, don't have the same color? And the answer, uh, Guthrie showed that it was five, five was enough, but uh, conjecture uh, four was enough. Very famous thing. It took more than a century to prove it. And uh, many, many great mathematicians wrote wrong proofs that say the theorem is not very interesting, but it's intriguing. And in 1976, Apple and Haken, uh, uh, with the help of uh, IBM, uh, they made the proof, which is in two parts, a mathematics paper, standard mathematics paper, that shows that you can reduce the problem to a finite number of cases, big but finite, 10,000. 
And these cases were studied one by one by computer. And the mathematicians say this is not a proof because the mathematical paper is okay, it has been refereed, but we cannot be confident in the computer, computer uh, calculations. Well, that's debatable, but it's, it's reasonable. At the time, you know, it was written in assembly and so on, uh, uh, difficult. Then in 2005, Georges Gontier, which I had the pleasure to have as a student, uh, Georges Gontier made a complete proof of this CRM uh, using COC, a very French system, as its name says. And uh, this proof is very interesting because it's a unified proof that unifies completely formally the, both the mathematical paper and the finite cases. And what he found is that there was no problem with the computation, but there were problems with the mathematical paper. Especially because in several places it was written omitted proof, obvious but long. And when you try to do it for real, a la Gödel, if you want, ah, it didn't work. And he had to rethink entirely the field. And in 2013, and this is very exciting for many mathematicians, uh, this team of, uh, led by Georges Gontier proved the Fight Thompson theorem, which is a, uh, uh, a theorem that was uh, frightening for mathematicians about uh, the classification of groups. 250 pages of heavy mathematics, two volumes of the uh, Annals of Mathematics, something very, very, very... Uh, and uh, the proof starts by a sentence saying, if you want to read the proof, it will take you one year if you are a well-trained mathematician. So, and now it's all in machine, entirely in machine, with a fabulous architecture. So this is changing even mathematics. Algorithmics might be changing parts of mathematics, not all mathematics is extremely rich. So that's interesting, and it, it, it questions the notion of proof completely, of human proof especially. Actually, the proof of Faye Thompson was uh, basically right, except for a few misspellings, but that's it. In art, I will talk only about music because uh, that's the, way, the thing I know and I work on. So this is 20th century. Uh, comp contemporary music, well, here you have classical music and you have uh, classical scores. So a score is a very nice language, um, quite complicated to read for uh, tourists, but uh, it's precise. No, it's not very precise. Uh, for example, in scores, you have time, which is the, the black, the, the bubble. When you play, you should never play what is written. You should always play uh, with rhythm, with the baroque inequality, with swing in jazz, which means the tempo is not what is written. You interpret the tempo in very subtle ways, and uh, you recognize people just by the way they interpret the tempo. Good. And then when you do that, uh, it's fine, and, uh, and, uh, but in the 20th century, people started mixing electronics and, and uh, contemporary composers started mixing electronic music, pre-recorded or generated by computer after that, to, uh, to human-played music. And then it was, it was not very nice, and Boulez knew that, for example. He was always afraid of that. He said, you know, the music is played by a computer with the humor of a computer and the musical sense of a computer, and uh, interprets have to follow what is played. And that's not what they like to do. They like to play the music with their heart, with, their, uh, with uh, energy, with uh, an equality everywhere. So, uh, at IRCAM, uh, Archia Comte, uh, uh, a researcher, <clears throat> and his team, a young guy, made his thesis on that, uh, inverting completely the, the thing. That is, instead of having the people follow the electronics, do the converse. So his system is able to follow the players, to essentially to at very precisely know exactly what is played in the score by the players in real time and to adapt the electronic music to the game, of, to the way the, the players play which is a complete change in mindset. And this is used after, just after I said this system was used uh, in many, many places in Tokyo and so on, experimentally. And now uh, we have no idea of where it is used. It's used everywhere in, uh, on the earth. But now imagine ma music schools. Before, assume you want to play a Mozart, you are a pianist and you want to try a Mozart concerto. How do you do that? You hire an orchestra? No. So you get the MIDI. Of the, of the orchestra. But if you place the MIDI on your computer, it do, it's like disco, it's boom, boom, boom. No. But you play and the orchestra follows you. And so that's a major difference to learn music or to play music at home or to enjoy music. And that's a fabulous thing. There are many more things, like a question we are asking now. If we can detect what the human beings do, 
compose the right away said, but then we say on this event, we shall start this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, electronic music, and on this event we shall... So now, what's happening? A score becomes something different. What is a score readable by both a computer and a human being? That's a completely open question. Now, the, the musicians uh, invent new notation for every, every piece, which means that there are many pieces that have been composed in 2000 that cannot be replaced anymore because nobody remembers uh, uh, what they mean. So what is the language of music? We shall have a meeting on Strasbourg, uh, in the Conservatory of Strasbourg on that. It's a completely open uh, problem, which is fantastic. It's an algorithmic object on which you, you must reason with algorithms. Good. Engineering, that you know. Before science, when you build a bridge, I build it, sometimes it works, sometimes it breaks apart. Suspension bridge, about half of them have fallen in history. Eh? They have been uh, since very long, including a uh, famous one, uh, the one that fell in uh, the 1920s with all the officials on board the day of the inauguration. Okay, and by try an, an error like that, you make progress. With science, it's different. When it breaks, I explain why. That was a big, big discovery. And in some domain, I can use this wisdom to build better, like in architecture. This is old in architecture, in bridges as well. Started with bridges. With computing, of course, you know that. I build it virtually, I break it virtually. After some iteration, and uh, with a lot of knowledge, I build it for real, and it works. That seems to be more or less true. It started with a 777 airplane. But uh, people tend to make a little bit of a mistake. Uh, a model is still only a model. As uh, one American uh, says, uh, you won't get oil by drill drilling the map. So models are still models, and uh, it's not magic. You have to understand what you do. Good. Beware of the bugs. So I will uh, try to explain a little bit why we have to be beware of the bugs. So this is the first bug in history, Grace Hopper, the first woman in computing who, made, who wrote the first compiler and invented the first language, COBOL. COBOL. And uh, this is the bug, the original bug. And uh, this is why it is called a bug. So what is the bug? The bug is, is a fundamental problem. On the left, we have Mr. Kepler, intuitive, rigorous, and very slow. Human, very good human. On the right, you have Mr. Pentium, Hyperfast, hyper-exact, hyper-stupid, to say the least. Okay? So the distance between these two things is absolutely maximal. So what is programming, computing, and so on? Is try to adapt what we think here to this beast, which is the most strangest beast conceptually that was ever built. Ah, so the, the, this is very difficult. This is very difficult by nature. And if you don't master this path, which is very hard to master, this is what you get. And that's very easy, and the cost can be very high. The last bug in, uh, in the Pentium uh, by Intel is one transistor that didn't have the right size, over 2.8 billion, and the cost for the bug for Intel was $1 billion, officially. Difficult. So I, I try to, uh, the, it's very difficult to explain to people what is a bug. For example, I work with mechanics people, with avionics people. So I don't understand because it doesn't exist in their field. So here is the explanation I found. This is Manhattan, and uh, I live there. Uh, I live there on the top. My friend lives on the bottom, and I give him the route to come, uh, route to come uh, home by a very simple machine language because he's a bit uh, Pentium-like, my friend. And uh, T is to droit, straight, D is droit, right, and G is left, gauche. So you can translate that into English with no problem. Eh? And this is the thing. So if you follow it, because it's not tight because Manhattan is full of uh, one-way roads and, uh, and uh, work in progress and so on, so that's the normal path. But assume in this long text, the program is on a million lines, uh, not this short. In this long text, there is one tiny error, like this. The, this T is changed into a D, okay? What happens? Almost nothing, you see, almost nothing. At this point, the, the itinerary just turned by 90 degrees. And with a total professional consciousness, it's a very, very professionally, the microprocessor does it. So you go nowhere. And the imagination for nowhere is high. 
If you make another bug, you go to another nowhere completely different. So this is the essence of computing. And having no bugs, having bugs and having no bugs is vastly different. It's just not, not like changing a little bit. So I uh, will take the example of cars. So this is my car I bought when uh, I was uh, out of the school, my first car in the 19th century, in the 20th century, sorry. <laughs> And um, now I change my car and I get about the same, you see, the, the car is the same. It has, a four, it has four, uh, four wheels, uh, one steering wheel, four seats, four doors. So it's not that different. It's just a little, the, the aesthetics is different. But the principle is the same, except that there are zillions of, of computers in it. And, uh, and except that coordination with the road, other cars and the town is on the way and you hear about robot cars and so on. But does that work? Right now, the answer is no. It has to be clear. I know this field very well. And there are huge bugs in cars, and now it's changing the game because the manufacturers are, are sued and they lose. So that's changing the game. For example, a poor woman killed four kids in a bus stop in France some years ago, and Volvo, was uh, condemned because they, they, they found a bug in the brake, which indeed the brake did not break uh, because of a software bug. Uh, memory seats were famous in, uh, by BMW in the US to, to push people uh, on the steering wheel while driving. Uh, I have nice stories about beams and wipers uh, at Renault because they did multiplexing on buses instead of having separate wires. So you had very nice properties of uh, sometimes you put the beams and you get the wipers or conversely, but not always. Uh, some people, uh, one, one guy last year died because the Mercedes electronic door has the interesting property, design property, that you cannot open the car from inside. And the guy died inside the car because it was just too hot. And uh, right now, uh, Toyota has a uh, huge problems because uh, very big bugs have been found in the co uh, engine control and uh, the software has been, uh, has been examined and criticized by exper experts and you can read the reports and they say that, that there is no way to patch and correct this software the way it is built. Ah, and you can uh, have all this information on the web. Mm, now you are talking about robot cars. I went to several car, uh, uh, car conferences and at the end, there is always a guy coming in the lawyer and the insurance guy that say, you know, I'm not sure you will put this car in, uh, uh, in the hands of people because there will be a big difference. You cannot blame the driver anymore. Who will be responsible? How will we be insured? And uh, then everybody keeps silent so far. Good. There are lots of ways to feed the bugs, and they are all related to mental inversions. Uh, see computing as a secondary concern that's uh, absolutely hyper-frequent. Use reasoning valid in your domain, but not in computing. And that's the main, the main thing. And, uh, for example, Ariane 5 uh, uh, exploded at uh, its first launch, exploded because of a stupid software bug in a piece of software that never had any use, by the way. It was written, it was writing in a write-only memory, which is a strange thing to do. Nobody was reading what, the, what was written. And uh, it failed while everything was working perfectly, including the software. But uh, uh, let me tell you just the example, uh, simplified. There is one rule in uh, space, is that a bug is critical if and only if it is not detected. Because when it is detected, you can go to the spare. And so the, 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 inertial, uh, the, the inertial unit which uh, finds the vertical, which is absolutely critical for driving, had an internal bug on a piece of code that was no use. But then it obeys the rule. That is, it says, oh, there is a bug, but it has no importance whatsoever, but I found the bug, so it's not critical because I found it, so I shut down. So uh, shut down, the vertical was lost, but there is a spare, which is exactly identical, it shut down exactly at the same moment with a, pro with a program that has no use whatsoever. So that's how the first launch of Ariane was killed. And I had made a report on uh, space software before with 20 other people. Uh, we tell the way you do software, it will never work, you will have a uh, lot of trouble, so we were fired. Interesting. Just a few months before. Uh, well, test only what should work, that's a major way to have, uh, but basically, basically, 
people who generate a lot of bugs ignore the fundamentals of algorithmic thinking and practice. They don't know how to think in this field. They think that you think in this field as in other fields. Is that not true? Good. Another case is uh, failure probabilities. I had to do that in nuclear plant analysis. Uh, software is very different from hardware. For example, in hardware, you can uh, compute probability of failure for a circuit or anything. But probability of software bug is mostly meaningless. What is not meaningless is the, the fact that uh, there is a probability that a software bug will yield a uh, system failure. That, that can be analyzed. But uh, software has bug or doesn't have bug, provided you know what it should do, which is not always the case. But a bug that kills the system is never a failure of the software. The software does exactly what has been written, unless there is a bug in the hardware, which is different. It's a failure of the software writer. And that's immensely hard to explain to people. But it's making progress. Well, well, once you get beaten with huge bugs, uh, you better... Uh, uh, OK. And if you want to know how to avoid bugs, which is, uh, which is also something to do, you just come to my course this year, which is called Ula, Proving Problems. I know what's happening. It's uh, not a bug, but it's a weakness of my computer. Proving Programs, why, when, and how. And uh, that's another subject. Every Wednesday from March 5th to April 1st. Education. Education is something we work a lot uh, on uh, with uh, Serge Abidboul in, part uh, in particular and others. Lagging education is very, very, uh, is a big problem. So this is Emily, my uh, two years old grandson. So you see, she is two weeks, two, two years and one week old. Many people think that she is working. Uh, she cannot speak, she cannot read, she cannot write. But she's very professional, okay? <laughs> and uh, and that, that's what I said already. Uh, I said already that, uh, that uh, uh, for her, it's like a cat. It's a kind of uh, animal that existed before her. So this girl, I'm afraid, has a reasonable chance still not to learn anything about computing until she is about 20 or 18. This is, what, this is what happened to all kids in France now. And that's really bad. And uh, there are lots of reasons, so it's not a simple problem. Well, education dislikes new disciplines. That's absolutely true. It's recent, because in the 19th century it was not true. When electricity was invented, it was, it was uh, taught very fast. And people like it, but they didn't teach much more, uh, many more things before. Uh, uh, computer science was introduced in 1981 uh, in France and was suppressed in 1997. What a good idea. It came back uh, because of our action in particular in 2012, uh, but with very limited or no teacher training. I mean, teacher training paid by teachers, which is not uh, extensible. Uh, there are lots of reports saying this is not reasonable and, uh, and the economy will be harmed and the consciousness and uh, democracy. If the people don't know, I mean, uh, I work with, uh, with deputies and senators and uh, trying to explain them what is uh, uh, informatic security or why the Hadopido is, uh, was stupid before it was applied, much before it was applied and so on. Uh, it's very difficult because they, they, they try to understand, but... Uh, they, they don't know the very basics, so what can you do? It's difficult. And uh, there is a lot of work by politicians now about numeric encodage, huh? huh? be precise. But still, that's still very interesting, but the action is, is not yet there. Uh, it's not true everywhere. Uh, I had the pleasure of being president of the uh, Committee of uh, Informatics Europe Best uh, Program in Education Award, and it's not, uh, for example, in England. England has decided for computing, which we call still informatic in France because we think it's a nice word. Not sure in English it's the same word. Uh, as a true scientific discipline from primary school to baccalaureate equal to other sciences. So this is decided and they did something, they have done something which is impossible in France, which is to say uh, to an association called Computing at School, which is uh, doing brilliant thing, oh, you are competent enough to deal with that better than us. Uh, I wait for the French ministry to say that somebody is more competent. Not true, not uh, done. Well, so that's a big problem. So if you have kids, beware. Your kids may reach 20 years old without knowing anything in computing. We need collective action of everybody.
not just computer scientists. This is a strategic problem. We need action of everybody. This is also true in the US. This is also true uh, everywhere, but I think we are moving uh, even slower here. Conclusion. Well, I won't try to convince you that informatics pervades everything, uh, including art, which is more recent and not universal. Many artists don't care and they are right. Nevertheless, fundamentals remain ignored. No teaching, no formation continue. I didn't write the English term, I didn't know it. So. The naive idea is that usage is the thing that has to be taught. That if you know how to use a tablet, you understand informatics. That's bullshit, okay, and precise. Uh, or that uh, some coding is good. Yeah, some coding is good, it's true. That is true, but uh, you need a little more. You need a bit of thinking. That is like, like uh, if you want to do mathematics, doing addition and multiplication has its limits. So learning how to use a computer or a smartphone, understanding the richness of computing, that's different. And this is the best way to say in a slave position. I forgot a different sign here. It is different. Um, kids know how to use smartphone. They don't understand anything about computing. Some kids do. OK. Safety and security problem, I didn't talk about them. So safety, absence of bug, and security, you know, remain vastly underestimated. Good example, the SCADA systems that drive factories, uh, the, the control system of factories. Uh, there have been a nice study done showing that you find, uh, you know, uh, many of them have the Siemens software, which was absolutely not meant for security, made famous by the Stuckness virus, by the way. And uh, the, uh, people found that there were 15,000 easily accessible and easily, easily hijackable uh, such system of factories on the web, which is very strange. Uh, technical legal questions remain completely underanalyzed, and uh, we have a problem in that the, the average age of uh, elected people is, uh, is not compatible with knowledge of, uh, of algorithm and computing, so that's a big problem all over the world, I guess. But no real progress will occur without an understanding of computing, what it is, not only the surface, but a little bit more, and its impact, a real cooperation with different cultures, thanks to this conference, and a teaching of real computer science dispensed by true professors. The main problem in teaching is that there are no professors. It's horribly expensive to make new professors, so let's make no move at all. That's the current doctrine. It won't work. It won't work, it is dangerous. We have, everybody has to find to get this. Thank you. So thank you, Gerard, Oops, for this uh, very nice, very inspiring, yet entertaining conference. And uh, I'm pretty sure we'll have questions. Are we? No, we don't. Okay, so let me try with one. So in the very beginning of your talk, you were basically saying that the, uh, to understand and to uh, move along with the uh, digital revolution, say, uh, basically you need computer scientists and know people from the humanities. And then in your last oh, no, slide... No, 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 no. Oh, come on. It's, it's no, no, I never say that. I need that people for, from humanities have to understand a little bit about the inside. Okay, so that, that's what the question is. Since yeah. the, then in your last slide, you say just the opposite. So I wanted to know if we should change the conference to a computer scientist conference or if we're in, in the good way in your sense. No, I didn't say that in the beginning at all. Or, or, maybe, or maybe I did say it, but that was not my intention. Where did I say that? Ah, it was basically saying that when That? You, this? It was basically when you said that moving from uh, informatic to numeric, uh, it, was it was very important to have a computer scientist view and not to, have, and not to think too much about what was happening on the, on the uh, digital No, it, uh, no, no I, that's not what I want to say. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, right, moving, right. moving from informatic to numeric, I was part of it because my first course was uh, Pourquoi et comment le monde devient numérique? And I wanted to say that informatics is part of a bigger thing. For example, uh, applied mathematics is numeric, but it's not informatic. It, it is in the game when you model things and so on. Uh, no, what I say here 
is that I know the story because I've been 40 years in the field trying to convince people not in, uh, not in uh, social sciences, huh? uh, uh, the deciders, uh, I mean, the cordemine, so cordemine is supposed to be uh, pushing technology and so on, and people were completely against. And for example, in, at, in my school at Ecole des Mines, which, is, uh, which tell, uh, names itself the first engineering school in France, informatics was not taught because people say, in 2000, people keep say, kept saying, well, we have to wait a little bit to see if it is a fashion or, or if it will last. So this is what uh, I fought against, not, not social sciences. Uh, but uh, but the, the change of world, I mean, informatics has always, in France, we are the only country not to have been uh, built a computer after the war. We are the only country that uh, completely missed the industrial development. Uh, not the only country, one of the countries that completely missed the industrial development. And that was a choice, a deliberate choice. It was not ignorance. It was not ignorance. People knew that they wanted to do this. They didn't believe in, the, in that. We got, ah, in the Telegraph, we got Telegraph Shop, 1850. And well, it, well, all over France, it, was, it went internationally. And then when the Morse Telegraph was invented, what was done in France, forbid it. When inter we had Minitel, when the uh, internet came in France, what was the role? Fire internet out of the country for long. Okay? We are good at that. So this is what I was fighting against, not uh, social sciences. I had no my, my brother is in social sciences. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> I, discussed, I discussed a lot with, uh, with him, and I had no problem with that. No, with uh, the people who take decisions. That okay, was the that problem. Okay, that was to be a bit controversial so that people... Sorry if you understood uh, <laughs> the other way. Uh, this is not what I wanted to say. No, that's okay, thank you. So, and thanks, for the, and thanks for the invitation. Yes. Oh, you have... If you think education is expensive, you should try ignorance. And my question was, what does it take to, co to convince politicians that there is a lot at, st at stake, and if you do not invest vastly in education, then they're going to lose a lot more than what they think they're going to lack in investing. So what kind of argument can we come up with in terms of convincing those who are in charge? Um, I, I it's think, a game uh, game, in a way. Okay. I think convincing politicians is, uh, is doable, and it's in the way. Uh, there have been a big change in the last five years, uh, England uh, helped a lot with the uh, uh, Royal Society report, which was the basis of all reports at the Academy of Sciences and so on, Academy of Technology. So politicians now, if you hear, if you look at what they say in France, uh, they, are, they get very much in favor of, uh, of teaching and so on. But the education system is another thing. It doesn't obey politicians. It's, it's much more difficult than that because, you know, it's a 1.5 million people uh, community, Eight, uh, 800,000 professors, <clears throat> big resistance to open a new, uh, new area. Mathematicians are resisting very hard. Many mathematicians, not all. Many mathematicians, are because mathematics is in free fall in France somehow, and, uh, and uh, they don't want this free fall to be uh, still uh, stronger. Uh, so convincing politicians is fine, but you know, the, in the education system, people say, know that politicians have a very short lifetime compared to them which happened, I mean, we, 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 uh, uh, every year you have to reconvince politicians. But now it's getting, this is getting good, I think. This is getting much better. But getting to practice, uh, that's, uh, that's a long way still. Because the problem is difficult, and it's known to be difficult for 20 years. So the best way is not to solve it. Doesn't help. You don't know where to start. So now what people do is say, uh, well, we shall uh, do a lot of things with coding, with associations, with uh, periscolaire, uh, and so on, which is good, but uh, it is very good. I know people are doing that here. It will help a lot, but it will be difficult to coordinate, it will be, uh, and it will be uneven in the territory. I mean, I live in the country. I'm sure in my village there will be nobody, unless there is some retired person that does it. So it's not an education system, but it's very good because it will foster ideas, uh, exchange of uh, techniques, and, and so on. So this is done a lot uh, all over the world now. But it's not education yet. So politicians, have you seen the address of Obama to Americans? 
10 minute address of Obama, uh, learn, don't play video game, build them. So it's very simple. This is not French. So it's very pragmatic. Think, uh, the future is in computing. Jobs are in computing. Everything will be computing. Go there. Now, we are not yet there in France, but uh, people understand there is a problem. And uh, there is a Ministère du Numérique and so on. But uh, that, that's, that's, get, that's making progress. But getting to the facts, mm. for example, François Hollande said, the, the, op the uh, optional teaching we have in scientific classes uh, for the premier, anyway, will be extended to all classes in 2014. Nothing happened. Because uh, the fact that Hollande says that in reality have no connection whatsoever. So that's, that's the difficulty. And it's a tough problem. There is no magic. But uh, not solving, not starting will be very efficient. And of course, in Asia, it's quite different. Huh? No magic, no solution. Uh, we fight. Serge is laughing. We fight a lot. La Société Informatique de France uh, fights a lot for that and uh, making progress. Uh, one bad thing also is the communities are feeding schools with computers. One computer per child. They give the computer to the child, and that's, that's it. Nothing, no teaching, no uh, nothing. Most, in most places, some places people do it, but uh, what's the interest of giving a computer to a child? Okay, maybe we just have time for one question. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question about the first part of your uh, presentation, about uh, the mental inventions. Uh, do you think there is a long-term impact with that? Because I think even among scientists, there is a kind of a, a much more technomorphism that are taking places. We build computers at that at what point in time and uh, software and hardware uh, by simulating the nature and simulating the brain, simulating the human behavior. And now we tend to, uh, in social sciences uh, particularly, to tend to explain social behavior through computing. Uh, I, don't, I think that your talk about algorithms is very uh, um, uh, relevant because it's about procedural knowledge. Uh, but uh, I think that a lot of social scientists now tend to explain the social world and the natural world through uh, a, comput a computer mind, a, a kind of a thinking of, uh, for example, the basic, the basic uh, error is to think of the brain as a, as a hard drive, uh, to think about the, about the, 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 the memory, as a, as a kind of uh, uh, circuit, or things like that, or um, an integral circuit. So do you think it could be a problem in, from an epistemological point of view to interpret the world as, a, as the computer work, for example? Well, there are several questions in this one. Uh, I'm not sure any simplistic view of the brain will make sense. The more the brain is studied, the more it's unknown somehow also. Uh, it's much more, much, much more complex than uh, what we believe in uh, 20 years ago. Much more plastic and plasticity uh, is not explained. I mean, we know what it is uh, chemically, but uh, in terms of information, it's not. Uh, I, I'm not sure having a mechanistic idea of the brain uh, has something to do, or maybe with simple operations. Yeah, there are mechanistic explanations of the brain of fish, of some simple fish. But for creation, for example, which is uh, the best thing we do, uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, and AI is making lots of progress in learning and so on, but I, uh, I hope, uh, I still hope I will see the day where a, a computer will uh, laugh on a joke I tell he doesn't know, but it's not yet there. And uh, no, and, and I think that also the, the idea that we shall build artificial brains is totally premature. I've been hearing that since 70 about. And uh, no, we are doing research on the brain, research on other ways of computing, research on uh, different ways of computing, uh, less uh, mechanistic algorithms, but saying that we shall uh, build another brain. Uh, no, I think it's, uh, I mean, newspaper, uh, uh, there are two papers where newspapers go too far is the uh, artificial brain and quantum computing. Because this is very popular going far, but uh, I think the reality is harder. 
And, uh, but it, many things are happening, but I don't think it will change the mindset yet. I think we, we it, it, this has to be watched carefully. But the algorithm thinking, the stupid algorithm we use and the stupid computer, that will last long. So that will suffice for my life, which is uh, not very long from now on. So I don't know for the rest. So, okay, so thank you again very much, Jaff, for this uh, very inspiring talk. And uh, I think we can uh, round of applause. Merci.